Uh, my goal in this presentation is to talk a little bit about what I did as a part of my Gale ASEX fellowship and comment very briefly at the end about what we what I've learned through my work and what I feel the benefits of uh, digital tools can be for scholars in the humanities. Uh, let me begin uh, with my research question. I'm a historian of 18th century Catholicism, uh, in particular the S Society of Jesus, and the main question driving my research at the moment is simply how do missionary letters uh, influence European conceptions of the non-European world? My hypothesis is that missionaries supplied the sort of raw materials for European perceptions of American, African, and Asian societies and cultures. Uh, this is obviously a significant claim. It's going to take a lot of work to try to, um, to try to get at this, and I'm at the very beginning of this process, so uh, don't, don't you know, hold your breath for a massive splash of um, you know, truth bombs or anything. Um, but uh, this is a significant project, and uh, the work I've done with the fellowship is only a small part at beginning to, to look at this question. So I chose to, to focus um, the beginnings of this research on a single set of missionary letters. Uh, the Lettres Edifiantes et Curieuses uh, were a set of French language missionary letters from Jesuit missionaries compiled and published from 1703 until 1776. The LEC, as I'm calling them because any good digital humanist uh, has to abbreviate, um, was perhaps the most widely known collection of missionary letters in 18th century Europe. Numerous contemporaries mentioned the letters in one form or another. Historians have long believed that the LEC had a wide readership. Thus, they're a really good starting point for thinking about the reach of missionary letters uh, in this period. My goal of the fellowship um, was to use the Gale Digital Scholars Lab and uh, 18th Century Collections Online uh, to trace the reception history of the LEC in English language publications in the 18th century. To do so, I attempted to identify works that reference, replicate, or incorporate information from the LEC to analyze these works for patterns. Thus, the project had kind of two distinct phases, the, the building phase and the analysis phase. And I'll detail a little bit uh, about both of those. The significant challenge here was that the LEC um, is, a, is a French language text. And my objective was to trace the influence of this text on English language writings. I couldn't do a simple sort of text reuse analysis, right, or, or simple keyword search to trace influence. It wouldn't work. So I had to devise a way to search the ECHO database that would reflect the reach of, of the LEC. And my idea, um, and what I went with, was to create a taxonomy of keywords that connected with both the LEC and English language writings. In doing so, I first created a database of uh, all the letters included in the LEC's 34 volumes, and there are hundreds of them. From that database, I determined the unique set of words that would cross the French-English linguistic boundary. What I focused on were the names of the authors and recipients of the letters. Uh, then I derived another set of words that I translated into forms that would be more recognizable in English language publications. This included uh, place names, for example, and just the title of the, the Lettres Edifiantes et Curieuses as well. I then use these search terms to identify documents in ECHO that reference, replicate, or incorporate the LEC. So uh, this is, I think, yeah, um, the, the taxonomies that I came up with, right? Uh, everything from the title, curious, uh, edifying letters, right? To the names of senders of letters, to the names of the recipients of letters, um, and then place names both in their original form and in a sort of a trans translated, sort of adjusted form as well. So step two was uh, once I found all the, the, the hits, right, in echo of all these things, step two is to analyze the results. Uh, once I built the content sets in the lab, I focused my analyses on three tools, the document clustering tool, the sentiment analysis tool, and the topic modeling tool. I'll, I'll detail those a little bit and what I got from them. I began by testing all of these tools using the default cleaning protocols, and like a lot of my uh, colleagues here, uh, noticed that the results were pretty lackluster. Um, they didn't tell me much. That's because there was a lot of noise, um, words that frequently appeared but didn't provide much analytical value. So as per um, Chris Hot Houghton's, Houghton's uh, shout out to Chris, uh, suggestion, I use the, the lab's n-gram analysis tool as a way to identify the noise in my corpus and then add 
those uh, those bits to my stop word list and, and sort of um, use it to remake cleaning protocols. It was, a, it was a great suggestion by Chris to use some of the analytical tools in the lab, actually not for analysis, but for further refining your analysis. Um, really, really great suggestion by him. So uh, this produced um, a, a series of analyses that, that led to some really interesting results. The first uh, tool that I used was the sentiment analysis tool. Um, if you're not familiar with this, this sort of judges the, the kind of um, tone of words to try to get at uh, a document's sort of overall po you know, positive or negative kind of um, feeling, right? And uh, it's admittedly a kind of imperfect tool for 18th century text because uh, if you know anything about sentiment analysis tools, it was they, they were created based uh, on or they're created for ways to analyze like social media, I believe, right? Um, so it's not a, a particularly uh, easy to apply on 18th century text. But I tried it anyways um, to see what would what would result. And the results, um, insofar as we can sort of trust them, are are, are actually were actually pretty interesting. Um, especially for a historian of early modern Catholicism. Across the 18th century, the documents that referred to the LEC were shockingly neutral in sentiment. And this is really surprising, given the general assumptions that historians have made about the deeply held anti-Catholic feelings in 18th century Britain at the time, and more specifically, the intense anti-Jesuitism. One would assume that this would translate to documents that treat the LEC and the information therein with disdain or mockery, right? Um, polemical texts that just made fun of Jesuits a bunch, right? Uh, but upon first uh, initial glance, right, this didn't seem to be the case. Authors seemed to be using the LEC for decidedly unpartisan reasons. The next tool I used was the document clustering tool, and I, I use this simply to um, figure out the reach of the LEC. Was it simply a, hand, a handful of similarly constructed texts that referenced the LEC, or was the scope broader? And uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, the document clustering analysis revealed a very uniform distribution of references to the LEC. Uh, in an analysis that identified 10 clusters, no single cluster had more than 40 documents in it, which was pretty thin, actually. And the proximity of the documents in each cluster was not particularly tight. It seems like the LEC was important for a wide range of English language publications. And then finally, uh, this sort of begged the final question of what topics seem to be the most um, of the most interest for people that were using information from the LEC. A topic modeling analysis turned up a few distinct groups. Uh, the most numerous were texts that seemed to be primarily interested in religious issues. This is no surprise. The LEC was, after all, a set of missionary letters. Um, but slightly more surprising was the focus of the other groups. The LEC proved valuable also for texts interested, for example, in trade and commercial matters. Texts like a new geographical, commercial, and historical grammar, which featured very prominently in that, in that uh, document cluster. These texts were no doubt designed to help uh, merchants and investors, right? Um, there were, of course, a number of French language texts included in, in the ECHO database that seemed to pick up on the LEC quite a bit. Um, the, the topic modeling tool identified those texts as well. But there were other popular topics too, uh, topics that I saw as, as being mostly reflective of navigation and seafaring, uh, politics, and also sort of global military matters. And finally, there was a whole subset dedicated to information about China specifically. Uh, the LEC was incredibly important for, for sort of um, uh, Chinese-focused writings, whether it be sort of fictional or, or non-fictional writings. Uh, and this, I thought, was a sort of confirmation of what a lot of historians have talked about, this sort of growing Sinophilia in 18th century Europe um, at the time. So, to conclude, uh, we might ask ourselves, and actually Roger asked this of us, so I thought I'd respond to it. Um, uh, can one create new knowledge? using digital tools. Have we created actually some new knowledge through this? Um, I would answer yes, but I think we should be really careful to think about what knowledge these tools do and do not provide. Uh, and I'm echoing here a lot of things that, that my colleagues have sort of said. Uh, in my case, the Digital Scholar Lab and Echo helped me confirm a very simple point. Um, yes, the LEC had an impact on 18th century Britain, right? People did apparently reference it, use it, re uh, incorporate its information. As simple as this statement is, it's nonetheless really important. Historians haven't really acknowledged the LEC's influence beyond continental Europe and really beyond sort of French speaking Europe. Um, and the predominant assumption is that Jesuit texts had very little purchase in England, right? Due to sort of the, the harsh anti-Jesuitism. Uh, 
So this in and of itself is a worthwhile scholarly contribution, I would argue. But the analytical tools that I use do more. They suggested that the reception in Britain was not decidedly partisan. British people were interested in Catholic missionary letters for reasons beyond just sort of mockery or polemic. Um, interest, moreover, cut across many areas of reading. It wasn't just religious readers who wanted to use the LEC. Uses of the LEC seemed to reflect a growing globalization of interest and influence. Attention played to paid to places such as China and to issues such as international politics, uh, military encounters, navigation, trade, right? All of these um, areas found missionary letters to be useful sources of information, right? In brief, missionary letters contributed, we might argue, to European colonialism, right? And the expansion of European attention, interest, investment, and control um, or, or attempted control in global affairs. So this fellowship has uh, helped me understand that digital tools such as those included in the lab are powerful in providing scholars with evidence for new interpretations, interpretations that can be potentially uh, or that can potentially change scholarly understandings of the past. But we shouldn't think that digital tools alone suffice. And I'm really glad to hear all of my colleagues sort of echo this <laughs> time and time again. In fact, what they tend to do is suggest further areas of research. Um, distant reading begs the further use of close reading, I would argue, uh, techniques in just in targeted ways. For me, this means, for example, uh, focusing in on specific topic sets, reading them more carefully to determine what aspects of missionary letters really did prove useful for, say, um, merchants or for naval commanders. Uh, it's in this combination of digital and non-digital tools, then, that scholars can produce, in my mind, sort of new knowledge, right, um, and important contributions to their fields. Okay. Okay.